Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the King Penny Podcast. This is episode nine. Man, we have a special guest here today who also brought a gift for us to check out, man. Remember that. We're keeping this in place, man. Eat for performance. Hey, man, it's great. Appreciate you, man. So with that said, no further ado, let us bring in our guest, man, today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Dr. Patrick Sean Larrabee. Yeah? Oh, okay, where are you from? I uh, was born here in Longmont, Colorado, of all places. Unheard of. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah exactly. I mean, it's very rare somebody who's born here in Longmont. Yeah. yeah. So you've been here a while and whatnot like that. What's the family look like? What are... So wife and three kids. Yeah. So, you know, keeping busy with that as well. Ages? Um, we've got everywhere I say three kids. That's just what's in the house. We've also got a couple that have, have already flown the coop. Oh, okay. And so we've got kiddos from the age of nine. Owen just turned nine all the way up to 24. Oh, okay. All right, so, man. That's yeah. a beautiful thing. Yeah. So what is it that you do for a living? So primarily I've got about three different roles I play, right? Okay. And it's kind of cool because they're all kind of a teaching role. Um, I'm actually the chair of science and health science for Front Range Community College. Oh, and yeah. so I teach anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology for the living in one, one sense, right? I'm also a chiropractor here in town, oh. and I practice out of left-hand chiropractic over on uh, Maine and Vivian over by the Longmont Hospital where I was born. All right? right. And then I'm a USA Cycling coach. I'm a USA Cycling Level 1, which is kind of uh, that upper – there's only like three or 400 of us in the United States yeah. that, that have made that. So and do that, and then I race a little bit. We're going to definitely dive into the racing. But first, I want to talk about how do you get involved in chiropractic care. So chiropractic care, when I was a kid growing up around here, I was still really active. Um, my mom and dad raised horses. So, of course, I was doing that instead of just doing the, the normal showing horses, right? I wanted to be a little bit more athletic. So I got into calf roping and team roping and unbeknownst to my mom and dad, snuck onto a couple bulls and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and in doing that, running track and field, playing basketball in high school, you get injured, right? And so yeah. I ended up going and seeing a chiropractor. Um, long story short, I was an athletic trainer at CU for a bit and then was training at a gym and a chiropractor came up to me and I was doing personal training and she said, you know, is that what you want to do for the rest of your life? She said, you know, nothing wrong with that. But I think you've got the education and the mentality to do a little bit more. And so I started looking and back in that day, a PT was a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. that you always had to have a referral. Okay. A chiropractor was still kind of its play alone. So if you and I are out for a run and I'm a PT, you might have to go to your primary care in order to get sent back to me. Okay. If I'm a chiropractor, you can just walk into my office and I can treat you, right? State of Colorado, can't prescribe drugs and everything, which wasn't really in my wheelhouse anyway. You know, I'm, I don't want to say I'm ultra holistic, but the more we can stay on that side, I feel like the better off we are. So that definitely helps with the coaching. Absolutely. And also the racing, I'm sure, as well. You can really scan your body and know right. what is really going on and stuff like that. So it sounds like you've been active forever, yes. right? Yeah. So let's talk about this fitness background because I heard you used to be really heavy lifter. So I used to do okay. So when I was in high school, I literally was up in Bertha going to high school. But down here in Longmont, there was a gym called Carl's Gym. That used to be like right It was oh, right, up here, Maine, right, it was right up here on Mountain View for oh, a Mountain bit. Oh, okay. And then it went down by where the overpass is. Yeah. Where the knit, where the climbing wall and everything is. Okay. And then they ended up on the spot next to where the pump house is for a while. Yeah. And then it was Main Street Gym. Okay. Um, but at that time, there was a lot of big, big scary dudes, right? When you talk yeah. about that, that were going to nationals and worlds and doing some damage. So to walk in there like and not squat 315, <laughs> right? yeah. no, you're like, you got to squat 315, right? And yeah. So I ended up, I was uh, squatting 500 for triples, deadlifted at 600. Oh, you! Oh, you were him. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So I was. Oh, well, you, you know, turned into a big scary guy. But, but, but yeah, but back in that day, there was guys who were deadlifting seven and a half yeah. in that gym. Oh wow! Right? Yeah, and that gym was over on third for a bit as yeah. well. Yeah. No, yeah. I heard from uh, another yep. gentleman that was from here a long time ago. He said, "Yeah, there used to be a gym over here and a gym," and yeah. I was just like, "Wow!" Oh yeah, and so again, I mean, it was. Back in that phase, right, probably of, of time historically, when football and wrestling and all that were major sports. Yeah. You know, in high schools and everything. Oh. So everybody was trying to get bigger, faster, stronger. Okay. Yeah, so it just kind of fit that. So how did you end up transitioning from that to cycling? So if we fast forward or back up however we want to do it, about probably 15 or 20 years from now. Yeah. Um, I'd had some pretty heavy bench presses and a couple car accidents and I'd done some damage to C67, C6 disc. Oh, wow. And was literally in my office one day doing some light bench presses and felt a pop and immediately my left hand went numb. I'd blown a disc. Yeah. And it was probably from previous damage, right? And 
got it fixed and it was just one of those things that I went, okay, I'm big and I'm strong, but what is this doing to my body for a long period of time? I was natural, right? I was using every supplement I possibly could back then, but as far as anabolic steroids and stuff, I wasn't into that realm. But I just kind of had to stand back and go, okay, I, I've got a family now. Where, where is this part taking me? And if I injure myself to the point that I can't practice, right? Yeah. Where, where'd you go? And so I thought cycling would be better. Little be known that once I got started cycling, I got into the cycling side of the sport called track cycling. Yeah. That's basically like doing deadlifts on a bike. Okay. So let's talk about, I want to, I want to talk about the accomplishments because this is what got me. Okay. You know, I, I read a uh, two time national champion, two time national champion and, and let, run them off, run them off. Of, so, uh, so 2015, 2016, I was very fortunate. Um, we're going to talk about goal setting, I know, a little yeah. bit, right? So my goal had been for a long time, for seven, eight years, to win a national championship. And I honestly wasn't sure if I wanted to do that in a team sport or as an individual, because yeah. in, on track, we've got both sides. And I'd been very, very fortunate that I hooked up with some guys that were pretty fast. Yeah. And it just came together. I mean, literally, it took, me, it took the best part about seven years, but it came together and we won our first national championship up in Redmond, um, Redmond Washington. On a big track, it's a 400 meter track. So as a sprinter, yeah. we, we like efforts of 10 to 30 seconds. Well, a 400 meter track on a bike is still probably in that 25, 30 second range. So it's kind of a little bit longer race for us. Yeah. And then we repeated that in Rock Hill in 2016. Okay, so so that was as a team. That was as a team, yeah. Oh, okay, so what about your? What about you? You know Me, that was my. That's my claim to fame. That's your claim. That's to fame? my claim to fame. I am man one, so and I go from zero to about thirty eight miles an hour. Yeah, in two hundred meters, but also to you got the the worlds coming up. So got worlds coming up. Um, in twenty sixteen, I placed as high as fourth in worlds. Oh, okay. Then came back, had a little bit of life, you know, situational stuff going on. Um, my wife then decided to go get her nursing degree. Yeah. So I supported her for a few years. Then if we get ready to talk about injuries, we had a major injury. Then we had COVID, and now we're back on the hunt. And last year, wasn't going to race at Worlds. It was out in L.A., California. And had kind of told myself my dad was sick and some other stuff going on. And so kind of told myself, I think this isn't the year to go, even though it's here local, so to speak. And didn't sign up. And about four years after registration closed, one of my sponsors called me and said, hey, I need you out in L.A., and said, you're going to get a special email. You're going to sign up and you're going to be out in LA with me. And I'm like, okay. So we ended up, I hadn't been on a 250 track because the one down in Erie had been closed. I hadn't been on a 250 track for five years. Wow. Went out to LA the night before I raced. I hopped on, spun about 10 or 15 laps. Yeah. Next morning came back and we took fifth out of uh, 12 teams at Worlds. Oh, wow. So. Just like that on a call. Just like that on a call. I mean, I've been training hard, right? And yeah. so, Yeah. But let's highlight these sponsors. Who, who, so. so I've got High Desert Nutrition. Okay. Um, I've got my team, Hammer Racing Team, that is um, sponsored by Thorne. Okay. Um, we've got some local sponsors, um, Paul's Coffee and Tea out of Louisville, yeah. Gravity Brewing, you know. And then you just get the Teriyaki Madness um, here in Longmont and Firestone is Tim's a friend of mine. And I said, hey, this is what I'm planning on doing. Don't know if you can do anything for me. He's like, you eat here a lot. Let me give you a couple meals a week, you know. And so... Part of it is just grassroots, yeah, which is every, what I really every enjoy. Little bit helps, man. Exactly. Like, even if it's a couple meals a week, a couple healthy meals too, right. like will get you exactly. where you need to be. Exactly. So explain. Let's let's talk about these injuries though, right quick. I okay. don't want to stay here. Okay. But okay. I wanna, That's okay. But I, but I do want to talk about them because you've had a, a few like major, I, major. I've had a couple. Yeah. Like injuries. Yeah. You know what I mean. So let's go ahead and run those. So. Again, back probably 15, 20 years ago, I can't put an exact date on it. I'm, if I had to guess, we're probably talking 2010, somewhere in that re region. I was bench pressing again, blew the disc in my neck, which just kind of reset everything, right? Because it takes a good period of time for that to heal. And I've, so I've got a plate in my neck with four bolts um, that hold it in place. Um, since then, though, I've still been back up to 500-pound deadlifts and stuff. I mean, so it's it's pretty secure. Yeah. You know, it's in there. Okay. Um, but I, that's when I decided I was going to go back into the cycling world a little bit more. Um, and then ramping up for worlds in about 2018, right? Cause COVID happened 2019, I yeah, believe something like that. Yeah. So 2018 ramping up for worlds and had literally carried our little one up the incline down to Manitou Springs had carried him up on my back and had no knee issues theoretically whatsoever. Next week we're getting ready to go to a park and I step off a curb and completely tear my left quad, all four heads full depth off the kneecap. 
And so that one, believe it or not, doesn't hurt. Yeah. But, but, you know, set, least, but it's still it's, it's a setback, right? setback. Yeah, you know, and when your ortho says, hey, most people I'm going to put in a brace, but I know you and I know what you do, so I'm going to put you in a cast. Yeah. And I go for my six-week checkup to get out of the cast, and he's like, hey, this thing hasn't atrophied enough. What have you been doing? And I'm like, well, I've been doing, you know, some leg raises and some other things. He's like, in the cast? And I'm like, well, I don't want to lose all of it. And he's yeah. like, I need you to lose some because I'm really afraid you're going to tear my repair off the bone again. You know? Wow, man. So, so coming back from those injuries, right? Yep. Let's fast forward a little bit because you're down a little bit. I'm sure it affects business. I'm sure it affects, you know, home life, everything. everything. Because you're down. Right? Right. I mean, that's right. and that's a big, a big probably part of your own personality and identity is guess what? Movement. Right. Move, and, oh yeah. And, and being active. Absolutely. But now you're down. How do you dig down and mentally say, guess what? I'm going to do. I'm going to heal up and go back at it. You know, so, right, what's crazy is even my ortho, when he's looking at that, he asked me, did I ever have knee pain? And I'm like, right, and, and you do this uh, as well. You're like, well, define pain. Yeah. Right, I wake up every day and something hurts. <laughs> yeah, right? Goodness. But but as long, as long as, like, stopping me from training, no. I haven't had that kind of pain. And, and so a lot of that recovery, right, you're right, your, our identity is wrapped up in this thing that we do whether it's my track cycling or being at the gym or whatever it is. And so a lot of it is getting over that headspace of who am, who am I without this? Yeah. And who am I if I'm just coaching or who am I if I'm just standing by the sidelines photographing? Who, right, who am I? And I, I honestly think that part was bigger than the healing. I mean, the healing was taking care of itself. Right. And after about six months, I was out of the brace and everything and walking around and people are like, oh, you're doing great. Right. And I'm over here on a leg extension machine where I can do, let's say, 80 pounds with my right leg and the left leg at 20 is sitting here just, you know, jittering yeah. its way up. Right. And you're going, but man, I'm, I'm starting to squat here and everything else. And so I think the biggest thing, though, for me, and, and we've talked about this or you and I talked about this a little bit beforehand is knowing your body from the inside and as much as I want to say, I was listening to uh, you and Dr. Shepler, yeah. right? And as much as I think we're good at it, there's no problem that I, I really think we suck at it. Yeah. Right? Because we're so used to pushing that limit that we don't realize that that limit is probably just a little bit past. And we like to get there almost every day if we can. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Some people go do drugs. We get, the, we get that chemical rush off of doing what we do. Yeah. And so there was a really big part where I had to keep checking in and going, really checking what volume am I putting into this training and this knee? What little things am I feeling that may or may not be giving me indications that I really do need to, to listen to, right? And even before that, I've almost always had a coach. And you may know nothing about track cycling, but you could probably be a good coach for me because I don't need you to write workouts. What I need is when, we're, when I'm building a volume block, for me be able to call you and say, hey, I feel like absolute crap this morning. And you look at the volume block and you say, you're three weeks, you've been trying to drop a little bit of weight, it's been hot out, you probably should feel like crap. But two more days and you've got an easy week. Just just having that right, right. person that, that, hey, look here, let me quarterback this thing right, for you right, right quick. That, yeah. that outside influence that yeah. looks and says, wow, you've been doing a big training block, you should feel like crap, two more days and we go into more of a rest period and you should start to feel better, okay. right? Versus, no, we just took two weeks off of a rest period. Why are you feeling like crap? What's going on? What's your sleep patterns? So pretty much knowing how to motivate and knowing how to tweak things around. So also, so that goes back to you, you coaching other cyclists and stuff like that. How right. do you find the balance between, because I'm sure you work with younger guys. Yes. And so they need to be pushed. Let's they need be, to be pushed. Let's, right. be, let's be real right, about right. it. You know, they, they don't have the, maybe the mental toughness that you have from years of competing. Right, right. How do you get that fire out of them? How do you? So I guess I'm a little bit picky. I try to pick people, A, that have the fire. Yeah. I would a lot rather have to extinguish a little bit of fire. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then have to build a fire all the time. Um, you know, that being said, I, I've got a kid right now. I'm coaching Caleb's from Longmont, Colorado. He went to get his bachelor's in Wales. Mm -hmm. Well, what nobody realized is you get your education over there. It doesn't transfer back over here very well. And he's trying to go to medical school. So he got into medical school in Australia. And so now our long distance coaching is kind of a, a cool thing. Right. But he wakes up at three o'clock my time. So it's really easy for him to wake up and say, hey, School's going good. I got caught up in all my studying. I need a weight workout for today, 
right? And it's kind of a little bit harder to build volume and stuff because his schedule is so unpredictable that if he's got a big test coming up, we might miss two or three days of workouts. Because he's studying. Because he's studying, right? So what do we do to get back in? Or one day he called me and said, hey, my head hurts. I, I'm just in this place and his girlfriend had been down for a little bit and then she left. So I think he was lonely and right, studying hard and had done okay on a test, but not great on a test. And, and he's like, so I, I think I want to go out and ride my bike and do some sprints. I'm like, cool. He's like, how many sprints should I do? I said, you're going to do 10 second sprints. How many of them? I said, until your head's clear. Okay. Right. So, so what advice would you give a young cyclist or even uh, a seasoned cyclist? You know what I'm saying? To make it in this, in the, in the cycling game. Wow. You know, that's a, uh, it, that's kind of a crazy one because there's so many people that show up with raw talent, yeah. right? And I thought I was one of those. I, I literally, I showed up, I'm a, you know, I'm a bodybuilder, power lifter who can squat 500 and deadlift 600 and you get on a bike and it's just a whole different animal, you know, getting that actually to the pedals and to the wheels. Um, consistency, you know, um, most of my guys, I try to have them on a bike seven days a week. And I don't care what kind of bike it is sometimes. I've got some track guys that I coach. I don't care if you want to ride your mountain bike, go get on the bike, right? Get the feel for that bike. Because especially like in our sprint tournaments, which in, it's an Olympic sport, it kind of goes back to almost a little bit of roller derby yeah. because a velodrome is about 43 degrees on the ends. Well, if you're trying to pass me, if I've got room, I can legally run you up the incline to take your speed off. Yeah. Right, so it's not just how much power you can put, but there's also the, all of this technique. And again, body awareness, right? Knowing where you're at on the bike, where's your bike at on the track? Where's the other cyclist, yeah. right? And because at the end of the day, um, especially in my age group, we all have to go to work the next day, <laughs> right? <laughs> we got right? things to do. We're not an 18 year old yeah. who can go diving through a corner and if you, cr if you make it, you win and if you crash, Somebody's taking care of your medical bills and everything, right? I'm the one. I'm the one that's taking care of the medical bills at home. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, you know, so I think just consistency, and I think that's what a lot of. And I'm gonna. I talk about it all the time in my class. I think it's something that's happening in America, where we get these trends, and everybody's on this trend for a little bit, and then they are it's off of wild. it. And yeah, I mean, go back in time, right? We had step aerobics, we had um, spinning classes, we've had right. Just keep going and going and going. And I see very few people who are just consistent. Yeah. And then I also think because of cell phones and everything, right, that everybody is so instant gratification that they don't understand that you may set a goal and it may take five or six years to achieve it. Yeah. But what are the micro goals, right, that you're achieving in between? And some of those are just some of my micro goals from my, some of my clients are, do you realize you've ridden 21 days in a row? And do you realize of those 21 days you had a, a string of four or five really good workouts? couple good rest days, some more good workouts, and it was all planned and you, all, you stuck to all of it. Even on days when you didn't sleep well, even on days when the baby was up. Yeah. You still made yourself a priority, you got in it, you did it, and there's this consistent build. So I wasn't prepared to talk about this, but I want to run this by you because this is something that happened to both of us. It was just a, you know, you rode past the gym one day, right? Right, right, absolutely. And I was talking to a guy, and he used to be a cycler. Crazy. You John, know, right? Yes. And, you know, he's unhoused now. He, he's had life is kind of, you know, I've just bitten him in the butt yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But he was on top. Yeah. A race. You also have been on top. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And still pursuing at a high level. Right. Right. What happens afterwards? Like with these guys that are on top and maybe face injuries like you have. Life happens like you've had like you right, I mean, right. the same things that they've been hit with. Right. You've been hit with. And but you've moved this way. Versus they move this way. How do you, you know, I think, I think a big portion of it. And, and so I met John, I didn't know John before I met him that day. Um, I knew two or three other people that had been living here in Longmont that raced with him at national and world cup levels. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't know his whole backstory. I know for me, there's always been this community. Uh, I took my kids down to Ninja Nation down in Louisville or Lafayette the other day. And they, La got all yeah, the, yeah. Lafayette, and they got all these sayings on the wall, right? Yeah. And one of them was community. And I, and I actually took a picture of it because I'm probably going to post it on Instagram or something okay. soon, right? And, and the community, I think, helps. Because even when I blew out my quad, I mean, there was all sorts of people that, right, are texting me and everything else. But then there were the people that were like, hey, I know you can't get on the bike yet. We're doing a cafe ride. We're going to stop at this coffee shop. Why don't you get your butt there? Yeah. Hang out with the people that you know you're going to hang out with again. 
hang out with the people that you've helped get to their spot and they've helped get to your spot. And I think, you know, so much of, you know, it was Jurgen, John used to race with Jurgen and Stacy and Tomac and Lopes, I think he'd mentioned. And those people live all over the US, if not over the world. Yeah. And so if you all of a sudden that, that we were talking earlier, that top line, right, is yeah. really, really thin. And if you're not on that top line anymore and the sponsorships aren't there, the people you were racing against, if they're still getting sponsorships and stuff, they're off doing their thing. And you kind of lost your community. So unless you figure out a way to re-engage and then, right, we're so used to, why do you go to the gym? And I, I know you can probably give me a list like this, but what are some of the main reasons you go to the gym? Me, my, mainly mine, mental. Right. Mine is get rid of anxiety, yeah. get rid of depression, feel good. To think. Right. Actually, right. I, I meditate oh, like, while yeah. I process through different situations that I maybe I have going on. I don't know if I do that part, right? But yeah. I know that, again, if I've got something i got to make a decision on, if I go do some hard efforts, yeah. when I get done, I'm driving home and I'm like, oh, why wasn't it's that clear. easier? It's right. clear. Right. Right. It's exactly. clear. Yeah. Exactly. And I think so. I really think that some of these people got that, had their community, and then when they fall just off of that, again, they're trying to figure out what is my identity, Right. Where do I fit? And now who's supporting me? Right. And we can all have the Instagram followers or the Facebook followers. And I've got a friend, Will Wong, who just did American Ninja Warrior, won a couple national championships last year. And Will's an awesome guy. Um, and, you know, sitting and talking, he he just got 15,000 followers. He was like at four or five. And then over the weekend, boom, just popped up to 15,000. Yeah. You know, and... Well, no disrespect whatsoever, right? When you see this, but how many of those people does he actually go shake hands with? How many of those people does he actually have dinner with? If he never posted another Instagram, right? So your community tends to be that smaller part that is somewhat intimate. Yeah. That, I mean, I've got people all the time that post on Instagram or something that I don't reply to their post. I message them. Hey, is everything going okay? Hey, you need anything? Cause it doesn't need to be a public affair. Yeah. Right. And I think that, I think like in John's situation, right. I think it's pretty easy. All of a sudden you get off that pedestal part, just a little, little bit in your community dissolved. Yeah. But also, I think also too, I think people isolate themselves once that happens too, like where they're kind of just shame or embarrassment of not being like right. Cause him, you don't feel like not being anymore. him anymore. Yeah, it's yeah. it's kind of, I think, and also too, I think just that thought drives a lot of people too, to be better because right, right, right. they don't want anybody to take their spot. They right. want to, you know what I mean? Always be, you know what I mean? The one that everybody says, Oh yeah, he's, he's so, but seeing how you stood up through all this and how you're still fighting and how far right. out are we from the world's? Um, Worlds is first week of October, so I'm what I think my little calendar over here on my phone wakes me up every morning. Says 83 days this morning oh, or something. This, oh, okay. Oh yeah, I've got you know a calendar to to kind of. How are you feeling? Like as far as like how are you? Like are you ready? Are you kind of? You, you know, know I'm mean? getting into that ready phase. I'm everything's getting faster. So I, I've got a couple of of strips that I, I do my accelerations on, yeah. right? And so a good way to do that without being on a velodrome and actually getting timing, right, is what's your top speed? And, and my top speed's creeping up, you know, a, a tenth or, or, or two tenths every week. And yeah. so, you know, it's coming around, right? And now I'm kind of in a training phase where I've been doing a lot of really short power burst, 10 to, 10 to 12 second type of things, mm. um, big gear, right? So, I mean, if you think about, it's literally like doing a one like a deadlift repeatedly for that 10 or 12 seconds oh, wow. on a bike, right? Because I'm starting off at zero, but this is a gear that'll get me to 40 miles an hour. So we're talking about like, you know, like kind of like cars coming off the line. Yes, exactly. L like, you know right. what I mean? And I'm we're running talking it, torque. We're talking oh, absolutely. Power. So I run a power meter, right? And it yeah. shows me wattages and it shows me torque and then it shows me RPM. How are you training to get that up by chance? Like, oh, I do. Like, I still you know do a decent I mean? amount of stuff. I've got a gym in the basement. Okay. Um, I've also got a buddy not competing with your gym because he's over there and you're over here, but um, customized nutrition and exercise. Yeah. Rick Jones has been around cool. forever, was in the steel yards and everything. And um, so I can go over there and he's got kind of a, a plethora of, it's kind of an eclectic gym, yeah. right? So you can go do some hanging gymnastic stuff or it's just, he's got everything. He's got a guy over there right now that's going to squat a thousand pounds. And where is that at? So he's on Old Pearl. Okay. All over right. in Boulder, yeah. Customized nutrition and exercise. Yeah. Oh, okay. I You'd think I've seen it. Him. And it has, uh, has some like old lettering on the yep. top. Yep. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sure you. I'm sure you've met oh, Rick okay. at some point. Yeah. You, 
everybody no, runs kind of in the same circle. But somebody right? squatting a thousand, I'm gonna watch this. So <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So I mean, this for sure. he's got two or three people that are competing in strongman contests at the national and getting yeah. ready to go to world level. He got he had this. I'm gonna call him a kid. I don't know how he's 20 years old or whatever. Came and said, "Hey, I'm getting ready to go do some true powerlifting big competitions at the world level." And ended up getting steel plates for him and building another rack that would support it right if it crashed and all sorts. So again, it's kind of electric gym, but right. It's cool to go in there because nobody's really competing with me. Yeah. Oh, well, but everybody's competing. Everybody's competing. Yeah. Right. And so I like, how I like the feeling, right. Like being right. around it. I can feel, you can feel it. Oh yeah. It's like who's him in here. Right. Like right. I love, I love it. Like when I go into places or when like, we just like, we just had a deadlift competition, you know right. what I mean? And just being around people like, Oh, okay. okay. And yeah. everybody's kind of like, you know, like that. <laughs> like, right, right. You know, hey man, just the energy alone. Are you going there and these guys are in there carrying like an iron cross thing or whatever. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, I don't even know how the hell I'd pick that up off the ground. Right. I'm used to a bar. <laughs> yeah. Pick that thing up. So how do I get ready? I mean, it's not that much different than somebody getting ready for a power lifting meet or an Olympic lifting meet, right? A lot of what I do is still deadlift, squat. I, because of my knees, do some isolation type of stuff. So I do some leg extension, leg curls, but a lot of the guys don't. I mean, it's just cleans and squats and deads and yeah. a little bit of, of chest or something, right? So hopefully you can kind of look somewhat good on the beach, but. Okay. So outside the gym, right? You mm -hmm. were talking about velodrome. Yep. Yep. Let's talk about this velodrome. In so Erie. Erie's this got a velodrome. Yeah. yeah. So um, back about 23, 2013, there was two individuals, um, Frank Banta and Doug Emerson. Frank uh, was a contractor who I think his claim to fame is he used to put together the Buff Classic, the big 100-mile okay. bike thing yeah. that sponsored athletes right okay. off of it. And then Doug Emerson owns U-Bikes, and they decided they wanted to open up a velodrome. So long story short, they started building it, and a microburst blew it down. And then they got it going back up, and then the area flooded. And then they finally got it up and running. So we had a 250-meter Olympic-level velodrome. The Dutch used to come over and train. The Germans would come over and train. In the middle of Erie? In the middle of Erie. Oh, Like, yeah. literally. Like, you're driving down County Line Road, and you're like, there's nothing out here. <laughs> there's a big church, and what's this big structure over yeah. here, right? And then, because of COVID and everything, um, they wanted to get out of it. They found a buyer... During COVID, um, the buyer who was set to buy it lost a couple, or lost some of their business. wasn't in a place to buy it anymore. Sat empty for about three or four years now. Um, three individuals came together, decided they wanted to revive it, and been everybody's been putting a ton of work in on it. We, uh, as four or five people who were doing some kind of inside work, hopped on it Sunday night to see exactly where it was at, and yeah. we're, you know, it, it's not glass, really, really smooth velodromes, like Olympic velodromes, I mean, it's like riding on glass. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're just that smooth. We're not there right this second, but it's a great surface, it's good and solid, it's fast. Um, they put a coat of paint on it yesterday, they put some stripes on it yesterday as well, and we're hoping to be out there for everybody, like getting you out there on a bike. Like, yeah, you, in were, two talk, weeks. you were talking about that. Oh, I, yeah, I, got, here. I, I got a bike that'll fit you. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yeah, so look yeah. here. <laughs> we, can, we can only get up there for 15 or 20 seconds. It's just like doing a set of oh, squats okay. or dead. Oh, okay, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, I can give you that. Yeah. Hey, man, look here. Yeah. But so, what is the level of interest in a velodrome? Like, I mean, like, so outside of the Dutch, outside, right. how do you generate people here locally that to come off of a. Uh, you know, like the streets right, and to right. get into here. Like what's the so it's, you know, it's a great workout. It's for a lot of people when they get out there, it looks kind of scary. Cause again, the ends are 43 degrees. Um, you have to stay rolling about 17 miles an hour. So you stick and don't slide down off of it. Yeah. Right. So it's a little bit different, but man, once people get out there, I don't know if you've ever seen the, it was the old Geico uh, insurance ad, I think with the little pig that had the little thing sticking out the window going, Whee! Oh yeah. yeah, 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 yeah right. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what's riding a velodrome is like. Oh, okay. Right. You get out there, there's no cars, there's nothing else. Two or three on the velodrome. You're just up there zipping around. I mean, I had a kiddo. His name was uh, Brandon. This was probably about 2015. No idea. I'm out there training. And when I train, usually I take two bikes out, right? Because we have a, like a warm up gear, right? Yeah. So when you go to bench, you're going to bench 135 for possibly yeah. a couple sets and then start working out. So I always had a warm up bike. And then I have a bike that I'm going to do my efforts on, which is my big gear bike. And I usually then, if somebody shows up, I coach off my, my warm up bike. Yeah. Sitting out there on a Tuesday afternoon, just hanging out, did a couple efforts, looked down, and here comes this mom and son walking up. Hey, he's really interested in doing this. 
do you think we can we can get him spinning around a little bit? About 20 minutes later, we got him on one of our bikes, got his shoes on, got everything else, got him clipped in. We've got him up there zipping around that thing, following me. And I mean, it was just one of those moments where you're literally, right? Because when I got into chiropractic way back when, right? I always knew my dad was a pipe fitter. My mom was pretty much a stay-at-home mom, right? And there was some back and forth a little bit about what are you going to do for a living? And, oh, you think you're a doctor. You might be better than us, right? And all this other yeah. stuff. And it's like, no, I want to find a different way to help people. Right. And helping people is those aha moments to me. Oh, definitely. Right. And here I have this kid who is having these aha moments and laughing and giggling and everything else. Well, later I found out that the year before that, he just survived cancer. Hmm. Right. And, and so it's those, uh, again, I was listening to uh, you and Doc Shepler, and there's so many things that him and I probably agree on, which is probably kind of what brought us on this, this path a little bit. Right. Yeah. But just helping people and, and people, Figuring out what they are inside and out and what makes them feel good. Man, that's, yeah. that's like amazing, man. That's really good to hear. So the velodrome will be open. Is I'm going to I'm gonna give you a two week. Um, we're, we're literally kind of flying by the seat of our pants, right? Because another, we get ready to paint, a final coat of paint. And we get two days of rain. Oh, yeah. We're kind of out, right? Um, that's We'd hoped for something around July 7th, and then we had all those rainstorms there end of June, and it kind of kept pushing us out because plywood gets wet, then it has to dry, okay. right, and all that. But it, it's a rideable surface right now. Yeah. Um, you and me by myself, I would take you out there and get you up on it. Okay. If I have more than a couple people up there, I want the lines on there. So I can say, hey, you're going to be down here in the sprint lane. Yeah. Hey, you're going to be up here at this other line, right? You're going to do this. And it's just like driving in traffic. You're in the turn lane. Perfect. I know where you're at. I know where you're probably going to go. Okay. All it's right. It's that kind of thing. So, uh... There, so there's an address for this place. Like, oh, I mean, I can find it on the online, it's, and I'll post it up on here. But is yeah, there like it's a, on a Bonin, Bonin Avenue. But it's right off County Line. You it's County, it. yeah, it's County Line and Erie Parkway. Yeah, because I'm sure you can't miss a Belgium. No, you can't miss a <laughs> no. no. Even I had I had some people come over the other day, and I was mentioning something like, "Is that that thing that was painted red and now it's painted blue?" I'm yeah. like, "That's it." <laughs> looks <laughs> like it looks like a roller coaster. Yes, exactly. <laughs> in yep, yep. In Mill City, nah, Doc. Really, man. Lucky man to have you on the show, man. Well, thank you. I, I really so looking much. forward to what you do, man, in the world, man. We're going to tap into that, man, Perfect. and cheer you on, man, and let you know the city's behind you. Also, too, we're going to uh, hype you up at uh, Left Hand Chiropractic. You know what I'm saying? Again, yep, yep. What's, the, what's the cross streets? The cross streets are going to be um, Vivian and Mountain View. Vivian and Mountain View and stuff yep. like that, man. Front range. Yep. You know, hype them up, too, oh, yeah. man. Yeah, oh, yeah. Professor over there. Coach, cyclist, family you know, man, husband. Well, hey, you know, the, the cool thing is my kids are all active too. So it's like literally the other day, and you probably saw the pictures that I posted. Yeah. Um, my wife was at work. She's a nurse. She was pulling a 12-hour shift. Right? Oh, they were riding too. Yeah, yeah right? I, so I come back from a workout, and I'm lucky. The street I live in, I can do most of my sprints right in front of the house, right? Yeah. So they're out there on their scooters or whatever. I get done. I'm feeding them lunch. They're like, let's go to the pump track. And I'm like, let's go, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. So, it, again, it kind of – what's nice for me is – most of my life is kind of around one central focus, right? And, and there's the family, there's the educational aspect of getting other people involved and, and just getting people active. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool, man. Hey, man, appreciate you guys tapping in, man. We got Dr. Larrabee here, man. We're going to put his Instagram handle uh, underneath him, man, so you guys can follow, tap in, and see what all he offers and what all uh, left-hand chiropractic offers, man. And appreciate you guys tapping in, man. Episode 9, man. This is King Penny. Dr. Larrabee, man, we're out of here, man.